All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bobby Rains. I'm here for our a pretty regular Investors Observer Workshop. I think it's normally three weeks, but we did four weeks this time because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm here and you're here, so let's get started. All right, so this is pretty much our agenda today. We'll talk about, look at some charts, um, talk about what else is happening in the stock market, go over things that are like which sectors and industry or sectors and industries are doing particularly well right now. And then the rest is member driven content, uh, questions, site demonstrations. I got several questions ahead of time, so we'll go through those um, and then we'll open up the floor. If you have questions at any time during the presentation, excuse me, you can go ahead and put them in the question box. Uh, you know, I have it open on my second screen here. so. I can see that if the question comes in while I'm talking about something, I can get to that in the moment. Um, otherwise, I will get to it toward the end. Um, I can't make an official announcement yet, but uh, we have been testing a pretty big upgrade that I know a lot of people have asked for. And we are, I'd like to say days, maybe a week or two away um, from announcing that. So keep your keep your eyes on your inbox for a big announcement from us. Um, as far as that goes, um, yeah. All right, so let's look at some charts. All right, so the S&P 500, it actually closed higher than this today, but I had to pull the chart before the uh, market closed. Um, but yeah, we've got a nice uh, a nice rally going here since sort of the beginning of October. Um, so that's been pretty nice. Uh, I don't have a ton to say about it just from this chart. Uh, when we get into some of the comparison charts, it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, but there is now and there has been in the past some resistance around the 40,000 level on the S&P 500. Um, so we could see a retest uh, once we get above that, then, you know, hopefully that level will support will serve as some some support also. Uh, the NASDAQ, not quite as uh, bouncy looking. I mean, if you look at this stretch here compared to here, this isn't really strongly bullish, but it is moving up, whereas it's pretty flat here on the NASDAQ. Um, it's just, yeah, tech stocks remain sort of, yeah, a little bit of an underperformer um, as these things go. Uh, in in this market environment, um, yeah, the Russell a little bit more similar to the Nasdaq in terms of being flat or even down over this last uh, this last period here. What really stands out to me about the Russell chart is you got this big down candle, this big up candle with a gap in the middle, and then these are just kind of all over the place. There's no consistency. It's very random. Um, that's what happens a lot when you have a market that's driven by news. We've had some headlines about China this week. Uh, the Fed was today. Uh, you know, there've been other things here and there over the last couple of weeks. Um, plus, the Thanksgiving holiday sometimes leads to some some unusual trading, also just because that weird half day Friday with very light volume. Sometimes it's uh, hard to predict which way things are going to go. All right, so the S&P 500 versus the equal weight. Uh, I went back three years on this one. We'll look at the one year um, in a couple of minutes. But uh, yeah, so the S&P 500 cap weighted, which is the, the sort of regular S&P 500, is really dominated by Apple, Facebook, Tesla, uh, Microsoft, Google, um, you know, those big giant companies that are at the top of the index. Um, and you know, some periods in here, I think it's probably changed. It changes every day, in fact. Um, but some periods here, they were like close to 20% of the S&P 500. Um, and they all did really well in you know the second half of 2020 and through 2021. And as I think everybody knows, tech stocks have not done as well this year. So um, you know, this doesn't look like a huge gap, but it's, you know, not quite 10% in terms of performance. The the uh, you know cap weighted index strongly outperformed the uh, the equal weight for a long time. Um, 
and has struggled this year. All right, so if we move to the one year, you can see that the equal weight, uh, which is the candlesticks, uh, is doing much better. Um, it's interesting that they're both flat in this last, uh, in this recent period here. Um, but this is again, right, the difference between down 11% and slightly positive on the year. Um, so again, that's that's about a 10% outperformance there, which explains the last chart where we've closed that gap. Um, you know, it was about 10% and now it's, it's over three years, but it's a lot closer um, now. Uh, and the reasons for this are, uh, frankly, some of the run up was overdone and things got to be priced a little crazy. And some of it has to do with higher interest rates, which um, if you think in terms of monetary conditions, uh, lower stock prices means the cost of capital is higher, which is what tighter financial conditions look like. Um, where this divide becomes even more apparent is when we look at growth versus value. So, oh, I got my charts out of order. Nope. I did something wrong. Oh, all right, what I did was I didn't update the chart correctly. All right, so this is the new one. Um, let me go grab the uh, other one real quick. All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so here's that chart over three years. Um, you can see the growth stocks really outperformed. Uh, you know, and this is the difference between, oh, yeah, at the widest here, this is like 80% up versus somewhere around, we'll call that 10. Um, and then that gap is closed to be a lot smaller over three years. So this isn't right. This is, you know. Over three years, growth stocks have still outperformed value stocks, but they're not doing nearly as well relatively as they were um, in this period. And then if we look at the year to date, you can see, right, the value stocks are down 27% and the growth, or the, sorry, the growth stocks are down 27% and the value stocks are up slightly. Um, again, this is about financial conditions, right? Value stocks tend to be stable companies that, uh, you know, are profitable. A lot of them pay a dividend, um, and you know, and they're profitable in like real dollar terms, as opposed to some you know, non-GAAP basis like a lot of the the tech companies, if they're profitable at all. Um, and so that's that's really what's going on here. And so when we talked about the the Nasdaq versus the S and P, and the S and P being you know up slightly over the last couple of weeks, and the Nasdaq being uh, uglier. Right, this looks a lot more like the NASDAQ chart, and this is essentially an even more bullish version of what we saw on the S&P. Um, and it's just that, it's the same thing that's been going on, or a version of the same thing that's been going on all year, which is tighter financial conditions means people move money into things that are relatively safer, and the cost of those, you know, essentially high-flying, unprofitable stocks uh, comes down. All right, so the sectors and industries that are hot right now, energy remains at the top. Um, we're still caught in a really interesting place here in terms of the things that make this list. Uh, energy tends to do well um, when the economy is doing well. Uh, if you think about how much of the energy sector is oil um, and how much oil is used for transportation, uh, people move a lot more stuff around when there is, um, you know, a growing economy versus a shrinking or slow economy. Um, coal is similarly, right? People use a lot more electricity, uh, you know, factories, et cetera, um, when things are growing versus things are shrinking. We do have Russia sort of, you know, the whole Russia-Ukraine situation sort of complicating matters right now. But... Uh, and so that is driving up energy prices some, but gas prices in the U.S. at least are back now to um, 
roughly where they were before the Russian invasion back in March. So, um, you know, I'm not gonna say that's not changing things, but it's not like the gas price, the oil prices are still super high. They've come down quite a bit from their peaks earlier in the year. Um, utilities, uh, this is an interesting one. Utilities are pretty safe stocks, right? Like just think about these in terms of bills. So you got gas, water, electricity. Um, those are things that people keep paying in a recession. Um, you know, they may try to you know, turn off a few lights or things like that, but it's it's very difficult to um, cut back on your usage of those things, especially when you're trying to save money, right? Like you can get new appliances, uh, you know, shower heads, things like that. But people who are really trying to lessen their monthly bills um, and cut down on spending aren't usually like, you know, doing a bathroom remodel in there. Uh, to save on the water bill. Um, so this makes sense in terms of tighter financial conditions, right? Most of these things pay a dividend. It also makes sense in terms of people kind of expecting a recession, which is a different story than energy. Um, consumer defensive is another one that is um, sort of in the same bucket as utilities as far as when people buy those stocks. Um, you know, confectioners, food distribution, tobacco, those are things where there's not really a lot of exciting growth stories. Um, you know, people haven't really invented a, a hot new food, especially at, at this level. Um, you know, occasionally you get a hot restaurant or something like that, but the, you know, those aren't making it to the, um, you know, the stock market. Uh, and then tobacco, right? Tobacco is, if anything, a declining industry. It's certainly not a growth industry, but those companies are all pretty stable. They're all profitable. They all throw off a dividend. Um, and the confectioners and food distribution are pretty similar, right? Those are stocks that people go to when they're looking for safety um, and maybe when they're worried about a recession. Um, and also they've performed well, right? Like we just looked at growth versus value. Um, and consumer defensive is absolutely in the, the value sort of space. Um, industrials, uh, this is another thing that when there is um, a growing economy, you'd expect to be doing well, right? And it's also a little bit of a, a post pandemic story in terms of infrastructure operations, airports and air services, uh, conglomerates. All of these are thing companies that either move stuff around or do something in that regard, right? Like that's a company you would expect to do well when the economy is doing well. Um, and then finally, basic materials, coking coal, which is the coal used in making steel, uh, lumber and wood products, and copper. Again, right? Like these are things that say, hey, the economy is doing pretty well. Um, you know, we're selling all of these things we can make. Um, which has been the story for all three of these industries. Um, and so it's an interesting picture we're getting here in terms of we've got some flight to safety, high quality kind of things that people tend to buy when they're worried about a recession. Um, and then some other things that aren't, right? Like nothing on this list is reinventing the wheel or offers the sort of growth potential of, you know, some new technology or something in the biotech space where it could you know, really change people's lives. Um, but these all point to sort of the, the basic blocking and tackling of the economy, if you will, seeming relatively healthy. All right, so what else is going on? Um, the Federal Reserve is still very much in the driver's seat as far as the stock market goes. Um, and really what we're seeing now is some interesting term stuff in terms of it's what the market thinks the Fed is thinking. Um, and so sometimes we'll see a number that will seem like a positive number for the economy and stocks will go down um, because that's signaling to the market that, okay, well, the Fed can keep raising rates longer because the fundamentals of the economy seem relatively strong. Um, inflation, inflation does seem to be slowing. It's still higher than I think anybody would like it to be but all the signs seem to be sort of pointing in the right direction as far as that goes. Um, the Fed is hinting, uh, and you know, Powell spoke today, and he remained relatively hawkish, but didn't really walk back anything about, to make me think at least that the, uh, the big rate increases, the 75 basis point increases are likely done. Um, I suppose that could change depending on, you know, some data that's, going to come out between now and the next meeting, but it seems like 50 basis points is probably more likely, and I would guess probably the next 
probably at least two would be at that size and there may be some that are smaller after that um, we'll see uh, and then the expectation generally now is for them to stay for rates to stay high um, right they're not raising rates so they can lower rates they're raising rates so they can get under inflation under control so they may raise rates and keep them there for a while um, so the economic data generally is pretty good. We'll get employment and PCE, which is the uh, the Fed sort of preferred inflation measure at the end of this week. Um, so those will be two things that will probably uh, probably move stocks around, but also the Fed will be paying close attention to those. Um, lots of the measurable things in the economy remain pretty strong, right? Like industrial production, a lot of those things still doing pretty well. Um, some of the survey based reports um, just generally tend to be noisier and less reliable. Um, consumer sentiment, uh, you know, was up, was pretty high at the beginning of the year and then started to fell, fall as inflation started to rise. Um, and then it, it almost tracks gas prices. It started to go back up as soon as gas prices uh, started to come back down. Um, right. People, that you know, four foot high numbers that uh, really hit people in the pocket book. It turns out really affect consumer sentiment in a ways that a lot of things don't. Um, and that wasn't just their outlook about inflation, but it was their total outlook about the economy changed. Um, and then gas prices went down, and uh, people got more optimistic about the economy despite nothing else really changing that much. Um, the housing market uh, is a thing that a lot of people are talking about. Um, Stock wise, the home builders seem like they're generally okay, right? Like we just saw in the last slide, wood and lumber products are doing well. Um, home builders have been pretty smart in terms of not having a lot of housing inventory that's unsold. They're pretty much building, building houses, if anything, slower than they can sell them. Um, and so they're not particularly exposed to the slowdown. Obviously, uh, you know they're going to want to keep people working and things like that. Um, and there may be some some pullback in prices after the big run up we saw over the last couple of years. Um, but I don't expect them to suffer too much because the population is growing and people need places to live. It's not like a lot of other things where you know people can just not have that. Um, you know not having a roof over your head is a thing that nobody wants. So, uh, you know, as long as the population keeps growing, there should be some increase in demand for, for housing there. So I think the home builders will probably be okay, especially if interest rates stop going up quite so quickly. Um, and we've already seen mortgage rates start to pull back a little bit. Uh, earnings are pretty much over. They were generally better than expected. Granted that was um, on the back of a lot of sort of, you know, low and lowered estimates, but, you know, there were some big misses, uh, you know, but a lot of those are companies that I think a lot of people had some suspicions about anyway. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond stands out as a company that had a big miss and yeah, they do that a lot. Um, Target is another one that for whatever reason seems to have a hard time um, meeting earnings estimates. It's not necessarily anything about the execution of Target. It's just that somehow the way they communicate what to expect from the quarter to analysts who make those estimates ends up being not necessarily accurate. Um, holiday shopping generally seems to be pretty strong. Uh, it's not necessarily lights out. Um, I think it's hard to model at this point, given the increase in online shopping just generally, and then the pandemic pushed some of that, but now people want to get out and do stuff. So how much retail is in person versus online going forward, um, I think is sort of a, an interesting thing to watch. And then also the, the discounting patterns have changed. Um, you know, some retailers were running things, you know, running sales on things weeks ahead of Black Friday. Um, we started with Cyber Monday and now we have a, a Cyber Week um, so that Black Friday may become less uh, less important to either people looking for deals or also people trying to gauge the holiday shopping season just because it seems like it's kind of been inflated into a, yeah, a whole like pre-holiday season almost. Um, developments in China, uh, you know, more developments in China are going to be interesting. Um, the noise about... Uh, 
you know, all these protests and then the government's response um, to the zero COVID policy is interesting. Uh, more reopening in China could push some commodity prices higher, right? If China starts, people in China start moving around more, um, they're going to use more oil to do that. Um, so that could push the global price for oil a little bit higher. Um, but reopening may also push down, uh, you know, the cost of some finished goods, right? Like you get factories reopening and get more stuff out of there. You, uh, you, you unblock some things and you have fewer shortages. So it's hard to know how all that is going to work exactly, but it is a thing that we're keeping an eye on. All right. So we're to the questions now. Um, so Scott said when trading short term, it always makes sense to establish stop losses, risk reward limits. Um, aside from setting Q reports and doing other homework, are there similar guidelines or risk reward limits that would apply to long term investing? <laughs> Hang on a second. My smoke alarm is going off. OK, sorry about that. My house is not on fire. I just have a s overactive set of smoke alarms. Um, so uh, much like smoke alarms, stop losses and position limits are both ways to sort of manage and limit your exposure to risk. Uh, in the short term, risk is caused by volatility, right? So if you're a short term trader, stuff like the Fed or the news out of China on Monday, um, you know, that can really throw your whole thing off, uh, right? Those short term fluctuations in price uh, that happen from day to day or even minute to minute, um, you know, that can really mess up a short term straight, tra uh, excuse me, trading strategy. Uh, things can move around a lot in the short term. Short term traders are trying to catch one side of that, right? So volatility is what short term traders are looking for. They absolutely don't want a stock or a market that just sits and does nothing. Uh, they want things to move around. Um, but typically they're betting on either up or down. Um, and so you're trying to catch the ups and limit the downs. And so you put in things like stop losses and say, well, hey, I'm gonna buy this stock. And if it goes up, I'll have to decide when to sell it. And if it goes down a certain amount, just get me out automatically. Um, it's quick, it limits the loss and you don't have to think about it as much. Um, and risk reward limits are another way to do that, right? Like if you feel like the upside is, you know, 30% and the downside is 70%, meh, that doesn't seem great. Um, but yeah, you, you probably don't want that trade. You want to turn that um, the other way around, right? So you want something that seems more likely to go up than go down. You want a bigger reward than you're putting at risk most of the time. Um, and so those kinds of things make a lot of sense for short term trading. Um, what you want to do is have a lot of exposure to the upside and limit your exposure uh, when you're wrong. Uh, long term investors also need to manage risk, but you're playing a very different game. Um, you're not worried about if a stock goes up or down on any particular day or, you know, what the next candlestick looks like. Um, you want a stock that goes up more than it goes down over some much longer time frame. Um, not really betting on the moves of a stock, you're betting on the performance of a company, right? Um, and so uh, things like stop losses don't make sense here, right? Long-term investors often do the opposite, which is buy more when something goes down. Um, the, the, this is the, the whole idea of dollar cost averaging, which is you have a stock you like, the price goes down, you say, hey, I can buy more now, and now my average cost of owning the stock is even less. So when it goes up like I expect it to, my profit will be on a percentage basis larger. Um, and so you do want to limit risk, but you're doing it in a different way uh, through things like position sizing and asset allocation. So position sizing is, you know, keep your riskier bets relatively smaller than your safer ones, right? Um, you know, if you think about the span of things from something like treasuries where they have a pretty low return, but it's basically guaranteed not to lose money, um, you know, that, you know, the, the, the classic 60-40 portfolio, um, a big chunk of that is just 
right? That 40% usually, um, and it's not all treasuries necessarily, but um, that's usually things that are pretty safe. Um, and then nobody is saying, right, 60% stocks should be, you know, some speculative thing. Usually it's like an index fund, um, right? So we just looked at the growth stocks, right? The growth stocks have a chance, especially if you pick individual ones, to be huge, right? Like that's where your world changing things come from. Um, but it's also very risky, right? Like there's the risk of, you know, fraud, like we've seen with some number of crypto things recently, or there was the electric car company, or I guess electric truck company, Nikola, or the um, Theranos, the blood testing uh, company, right? Like those could be, you know, life and world changing inventions. Um, some of them are just fake. It turns out that some of them also fail for other reasons, right? Like a lot of them are really expensive science experiments that somebody is hoping they can find a way to make profitable. Um, and so absolutely that can be a good bet uh, if it pans out, um, but it can also end uh, pretty catastrophically. And so for something like that, right? Let's think about the risk reward ratio. Um, you want that to be relatively small, right? Like if if the payoff ends up being huge, a relatively small piece of your portfolio can still be a pretty big return. Um, and then if the payoff ends up being, you know, something catastrophic for that particular company, um, it ends up not being catastrophic for your stock um, or for your portfolio. I mean, asset allocation is just the bigger look of that, right? So you don't necessarily want to you know, have a whole portfolio full of lottery tickets, right? Um, you know, I mean, going from one lottery tickets to two lottery tickets to three lottery tickets to 500 lottery tickets does on some level increase your odds of winning the lottery, but not on a level that makes, right? Like just buying a lot of lottery tickets, right? You, the number of lottery tickets you have to buy to actually guarantee winning the lottery is typically more than the jackpot. Um, that's why the lottery works. Um, and even if you did that, right, like, well, guess what? Then you broke even, right? Because you had a billion dollars worth of losers and one dollar worth of winners and you won a billion dollars. So cool, you're back where you started. Um, so you want to have, you know, sort of the whole spectrum of things from very safe, unexciting, relatively low return, zero chance of loss of capital, treasuries, and, you know, a few of those exciting things. And it could be, you know, almost like a pyramid in terms of how you're, you're structuring things, right? Like you want a little bit of the risky stuff and a whole lot of the safer stuff. Um, and one of the things you're going to have to do periodically is say, oh, hey, some of my risky bets paid off and now this piece is too big. I need to take some of that money off the table, put it in something that's less risky. Um, so, yeah, right. Like there aren't stop limits or risk reward limits in in the in the sense of like, oh, well, you know, have, here's this rules based approach to uh, to long term trading. But you do want to move things around, and you absolutely want to manage your risk. All right. So Dinkar said, how and where on your site do I find the most profitable and probable short term option trades? All right. So we'll look at this on the site in a second. Um, but there's two basic places. Uh, you know, that are real easy to find trades every day. There's the personalized trades, they're right on the options dashboard. There are up to three per day in each of three strategies, which is covered calls, short puts, diagonal spreads, and vertical credit spreads. And for each strategy, we have three styles, conservative, balanced, aggressive. Um, so that is nine categories, up to three trades a day. There's like, you know, could be as many as 27 trades in there. Um, and then we have the option screener, uh, which again covers those three strategies plus some uh, iron condors. Um, in the screener, you can dial in exactly the trades that you want. Uh, you know, the conservative balanced aggressive, uh, we came up with that methodology. Um, and so what shows up in there is what makes sense to us. If you have something you like to do and you think makes more sense, by all means, you can do that. Uh, just you know, turn the knobs in the screener. Um, 
So one thing to remember when looking at really all the trades here, but the screener in particular, the key ratings um, are about the safety and defensibility of the option trade. Um, they do not consider the likely directional outcome of the stock at all. Um, so it's like for a covered call, what I care about in terms of how well, you know, defensibility is, one, is the trade relatively short? Um, that's the case in all of these. Uh, and the other thing I care about for something like a covered call or a diagonal spread or a sold put is if I wanted to roll the sold uh, option there, how hard is it? Um, so if you have options where there's $5 strike widths and you're getting $2 for selling the call, um, that's really hard to roll without... Um, you know, having to, to put more money in, which I generally try not to do. If I have a bet that's going bad, um, I try not to add more money to that bet. Um, you know, sometimes it happens and it works out, but I try not to do that. I would prefer to be able to get $2 for selling an option and have dollar strike widths because then I can really fine tune it. Um, you, know, you get dollar strikes with across the six week weekly series. Now you can really play around and, um, you know, roll your option, roll your options, uh, you know, a lot more often. It's a lot easier. You're less likely to have to put money in. So those are the kinds of things we're looking for in terms of the key ratings. Uh, if you want the evaluation of the stock, look at the overall rank. Um, and then for short-term trades, you may just want to look at the sentiment score or the short-term technical score because, you know, for a two-week trade, you know, what an analyst's 12-month price target is kind of irrelevant. Um, and then, yeah, you can also sort by days to expiration, downside protection, how far in or out of the money it is, and for some strategies, the probability of assignment. All right, so let's go look at that here, go to options, start the options dashboard. Um, so here are the personalized trades. Uh, like I said, we have three strategies and three conservative, balanced, aggressive. Um, there won't necessarily be three in every category every day, um, but typically a lot of the categories do have um, all three. So yeah, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, you know, uh, the one thing about this question that is a little bit hard is profitable and probable. Um, the market is generally pretty smart. And so the things that offer the biggest return tend to be the most risky. Um, and so super safe and super likely to have a big return are relatively uh rare that they those things coincide um yeah so you can pick a strategy here um let's look at the bullish vertical spreads um okay you can you know pick an expiration so if you want say uh we'll say trades that are less than a month you know you can set any of these here um i usually like a assigned return rate of around 30%. Um, for risk management, you can look at the amount at risk. I don't do this much with the vertical spreads. Uh, the widest strike width you're gonna see here is five bucks. Um, I do use that setting on the covered calls and the diagonal spreads. Um, you know, stocks that cost $500, I'm not making a lot of covered calls on. Um, Overall score, we want something that's generally positive, so we'll just say 50. Key ratings, they're, it's one through five, um, so we'll just take the, the fours and the fives. Uh, and I don't actually mess with these, but I do want a trade that expires before earnings. We'll get into, we'll get into these in a second because you can also sort the columns. Um, but if you do have some strategy you like that identifies these, you can do it that way. All right, so. Like I said, you can sort the columns. So we've got all the fours and fives here. All the overall scores are above 50. We can go and go ahead and just look at the shortest trades. Click on the days to expiration column and it will sort it. It should, the first click should be shortest first. Yes, okay, it was. So that's one thing you can do. Um, 
You can also look at this probability of expiring worthless. Uh, that's derived from the delta um, of the option. So in these credit spreads, uh, expiring worthless is good. Um, the thing you'll probably notice is that the chance of the probability of expiring worthless and how far in or out of the money it is uh, tend to be pretty well correlated. Um, so you want to try to find something that's, you know, relatively out of the money, and then you can go look at the chart or you can look at the scores and see what it is, right? So if you sort this way, the one that stands out to me immediately is this 71 here. Um, I know nothing about this stock, but I see everything else in this neighborhood has a much lower score than this. So we can look at the stock, go see what the scores are. Yeah, I mean, it's been kind of flat, but that's all you really need for a trade like this. Um, somewhere else. Here we go. All right. So, yeah, th those are the places where I would look to find um, option trades. It really just depends on what it is you're 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 trying to get into. Um, you know, if you like what's in the personalized trades, they're there every day. Uh, otherwise, the, the screener is, is pretty powerful and there's thousands of things to choose from there. All right, so Jeff, I think, had a couple of questions. Uh, the first one was, I often trade based on many of your daily featured recommendations. Um, so this is, he's talking about those personalized trades there. Um, covered calls, verticals, diagonals. In addition, the personalized, op okay, yeah. Sometimes when the market opens, there's a significant rise or drop to the overall market or to one or more of the stocks in the recommendations before I have a chance to make the trade. Would you recommend it? adjusting the recommendation uh, based on market direction or individual stock direction or just not place the trade. Um, so this is actually one of the questions we get a lot. Um, and in most cases, adjusting it is fine, right? Typically what we say is find an option with the same expiration that he's, has either the same relationship to the stock price. It's like, you know, if the stock goes up $3 and the other, you know, the the previous, uh, the strike price in the recommended trade was 30, or sorry, not 30, was was a dollar out of the money. Well, then just pick, an, pick the new one that's a dollar out of the money. Um, you can also do it on a percentage basis. Uh, a lot of times a percentage basis is harder just because there aren't, you know, there's not that granularity in strike prices necessarily. Um, the other thing you can do is look for roughly the same uh, bid price on the option, right? The option premium should be roughly the same. Um, and it turns out that the relationship to the strike price and the same premium should be roughly the same option. They're basically two ways to get to the same place. Um, the exception to adjusting it is if there's something specific to that stock or the stock is doing something different to the mark from the market. So if the stock is down because of bad news specific to the stock, uh, the example I always use is if everybody's iPhone catches on fire, that's probably not a bad day or not a great day to right like try to grab a uh, an Apple covered call. Um, right, you, you're going to want to see how that plays out before you uh, before you put more money into Apple. Um, and the other thing is if the stock is down and the rest of the market is up. So even if you don't know why the stock is down, there's no obvious thing you can point to. If the stock that you're looking at is doing something different than the overall market, that's a good time to say, eh, I think I'm gonna wait and see what happens here and maybe move on to something else. Um, yeah. All right, so Jeff's next question was, when you make a trade and either some or all of the position begins to go sideways, do you have a preset exit strategy? Um, if so, is it based on the percentage loss, dollar amount loss, time remaining? Um, I'd like to get a better understanding of the factors to use in assisting me to get out of a position that's not behaving versus more time to recover. So the first thing is um, when we make a position, typically right, like a, with a spread trade, which is what I think he's talking about here based on the last question, um, right? The we consider the whole unit, right? So there's typically a bought leg and a sold leg. Um, typically, right, because they're options and they're on the same underlying stock, they're 
going to perform in some way where we the relationship is something that we would expect uh right it would be really weird for one one leg of the of an option trade to do something unexpected and the other leg not do that um but more generally we don't have a, a rules-based approach um time remaining is certainly probably the biggest dictator of sort of how we manage a trade um but you know there we don't publish stop losses here or anything like that especially for any of our option trades um because it doesn't make a ton of sense because they're because of this style of option trade um so in covered calls and diagonal spreads uh we can roll the sold call um especially the short dated ones um for longer trades we'll typically take a more wait and see approach um for a big move consider buying back the sold option in your covered call or diagonal spread right like these trades are essentially short the value of that sold option and so if the underlying stock falls that option price goes down now ideally the option price goes down because the stock is performing as we expected it to and it's just time value rolling off but it turns out that the stock price moving away from the strike price will also lower the premium there so if you can buy that option back super cheap um fine do that um and then that leaves you with more options if the stock starts to rise uh, so what we do consider typically is why is the stock down again, right? Like, is it something about the stock or the industry or the sector? Um, is it generally just a bad market? Um, you know, we like to say good stocks can recover from bad markets. Um, but if a stock has gone from the good category to the bad category, that seems less likely to be um, something we're, uh, we're going to enjoy. Uh, and the other thing is, how likely is it to come back fairly soon? Um, it's hard to predict, you know, a long-term bear market, um, but do you still like the stock, right? Especially with covered calls. You know, if you're doing covered calls on something that you like, um, it's fine to just hold it, right? It moves from being a, a thing you're trading on to a thing that you're holding. And you can sell out of the money calls against it um, on the way down and on the way back up if you do get one of those long-term, um, you know, bear market situations uh, like we've had this year. Um But yeah, you, you do want to think about, you know, how likely is it to come back relatively soon, right? Um, you know, some tech stocks and stuff like that we held on to during the pandemic. Uh, you know, I don't think we had cruise ships necessarily, but some of the other more harder hit pandemic stuff, um, we just, you know, kind of took, took our medicine there because um, it didn't seem like it was going to come back as soon. Um, and so... Yeah, that's that's really it. It's you know just kind of the the same process you use to make the trade. I think you can usually use to evaluate the trade, um, just in a sense of like, do I like this? Um, do I think this is a good idea? Is this something that uh, you know seems more likely to go up than down? Um, and then you know if it's gone down for some obvious reason, then you know maybe that answer changes. But that's that's typically what we consider. All right, that's all the questions we got ahead of time. Um, any other questions that anybody has, uh, by all means, throw them in the box. Um, yeah, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, uh, you can send questions in anytime, um, either for the workshop or not. Uh, this help button, will send us an email. We get back to most of these the same day you send them in. Um, so that, that's a great way to get in touch with us. Uh, you know, and again, if you have a question for the workshop and you want me to put together some slides or whatever, I'm happy to do that. Just mark it for the workshop. Um, some people just reply to the invitation they get. Uh, that's another good way to get in touch with me. Um, the next workshop will be the 21st of December. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, like I said earlier, be on the lookout for that um, announcement also. Um, also, the session is being recorded like all of our workshops are. You can find the past ones by going to news and uh, personal finance. Um, 
and so they're here. They yeah, we started making new new graphics for them uh, at the last workshop. The other ones all have this graphic, um, some version of that graphic. Um, so yeah, they're all there for you to peruse if you want. And the new one will go up tomorrow, usually about the middle of the day. Um, and we will send you an email when that gets posted. Also, it's just a YouTube video that's posted on our site, so you don't need anything special to. Uh, to watch it or do anything like that. All right, well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, so I am going to go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for subscribing to Investors Observer. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and I will talk to you again soon.